Welcome to Stitchery Stories, where textile artists share their life in fabric and thread. Inspiration, techniques, disasters and delights. And I'm Susan Weeks, enthusiastic embroiderer and textile arts dabbler who also loves podcasting. So take a break and enjoy our light-hearted chat and please share with your friends so they can enjoy it too. Hiya! If you love Stitchery Stories, then perhaps you'd love to buy me a coffee to help support the time and effort that goes into bringing it to you. Buy Me A Coffee is a quick and easy little app to basically make a donation to support the podcast. The links are in my bio and website and, well, everywhere really. Um, And all donations are very, very much appreciated. And so, right, talking of cuppers, I think it's time to get the kettle on, get a cuppa ready, get your feet up and enjoy this week's fabulous guest. Hello and welcome today to our lovely guest, Kath James. Hi, Kath. Hey, Susan, how are you? Oh, I'm all right, thank you. I'm going to admit this right now. We've already done this once and I forgot to press record. So it's, <laughs> it's just started again. <laughs> uh, and, and I will also, Kath, thank you so much for putting up with the, um, I think it was nearly a year's delay because mm. Kath was the next one in line and then I just decided I, 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 I couldn't do any more for a while. So I didn't intend it to be a whole year. So bless you, Kath, for, for waiting and putting up with the uh, with the wait. No, so. not at all. It'll be worth the wait, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> it's given you a chance to get more stitching done, hasn't it, to tell us That's about. That's exactly yes, it. Yes, Thank yes, you yes. for thinking of you. Yes, and <laughs> and I knew a special a special event was going to happen over the summer for you as well. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that later. <laughs> oh, you're too kind. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, I have a quick bio here from Kath. And excuse me if I mispronounce her specialist topic. (laughs) (laughs) Kath James is a hand embroiderer specialising in human anatomy. She started stitching anatomy after a series of facial surgeries, which prompted her to mix her love of hand stitching with her love of anatomy as she recovered. Yeah, like you do. Two excellent (laughs) topics to combine that. Uh, She now sells her anatomically accurate pieces to medical professionals and anatomy lovers across the world. And in summer 2022, Kath was the winner of five bronze awards for the Institute of Medical Illustrators Awards for excellent application of technique and understanding of clients' brief. Who knew there was an Institute for Medical Illustrators? But anyway, Kath got five (laughs) awards, so... I know Yay. we'll be coming back to that one. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, yes, right. So we can find Kath on her uh, website. Obviously, all the links will be on Kath's uh, episode, plus some um, some of her lovely artwork uh, will be on Kath's episode on Stitchery Stories. So we've got krakencreations.co.uk with Ks. So we'll come. Well, I'm going to ask you about that anyway. <laughs> um, you'll find her on Instagram as well. She's quite busy on there, Kraken Creations Kath. And um, she's got uh, on her website, you can sign up for her, uh, what is it, Hot Off the Hoop. Hot Off the Hoop, yes. It's her hilarious uh, newsletter, (laughs) seriously. Thank you. You you want to sign up for Cass Hot Off the (laughs) Hoop. It's great. It really is good. Right, there we are. That's that's that bit. I've hit record. I've read out the bio. We've done the links. Oh, my word. We are going well. (laughs) On fire. We are on fire, literally. Right then. So, Cass. Before we get started with your stitchery story, would you like to share with us today what are you working on and what has got you excited? I can't wait. Oh. Let me think. Um, at the moment, what's really keeping me frisky are my commissions. I've got a huge pile of commissions. Um, back in uh, February, uh, one of my Instagram reels went viral mm. and that meant I got almost 18 months worth of commissions in the space of a uh, fortnight so they what? really kept me busy yes it went berserk oh That's right we're cool. definitely coming back onto that one i'm going to yes you can't you can't let that one slip past me <laughs> right go on wow that's amazing right was, carry on i'll come back to that later yes it's a, a blessing and a curse yes interestingly but we can talk about that so yes i've got commissions right up until the end of this year um I've just finished part of the pelvis and the hippocampus in the brain. My next piece will be a cross-section of the skin. 
uh, then a colon, then a knee MRI, <laughs> and a few others after that. So um, that's kind of really keeping me frisky until the end of the year. I think what's getting me really excited, though, are some of my plans for next year, where I want to give myself more time to create the pieces that I love, as well as doing commissions. So I'm really looking forward to not being completely dictated to by commissions and deadlines next year and having the chance to create my own anatomical pieces as well. So, yeah, there's a lot going on at the moment. And uh, right now it's good. Oh, brilliant. That... <laughs> I don't know where to start with all of this lot. Right, so <laughs> it's, it's like the question I was going to ask you just immediately flew out of my head when I thought about it. So never mind, I'll come back to that. So right, yes. Yeah, so it's that it's that blessing and curse of commissions, isn't it? That yes, if mm. you know if you're doing commissions, it's great to have commissions. Yes, but the flip side of that is what time does it leave you to do your other things and it's yes. the same as a service provider you know I've had that I've had, had that for years as well it's always that yes it's great to have some work uh, but I can't do the other things I want to do as well so yeah yeah so with the commissions or you know colons brains all the rest of it <laughs> what do, do people when people commit that's the wrong word commission you <laughs> when people commission you for these things do they tell you like a little story like, oh well you know I want yes. to do a knee because I've had my knee operated on or do you get that yes. kind of thing absolutely um I don't get a single commission without a backstory and it's fantastic <laughs> and that's what that's what really inspires me to do uh such kind of good work I mean I, I always want to do the best I can yeah but the personal stories are really inspirational so, for example, um, uh, in the uh, when was it? A few months ago, a good six months ago, I was asked to stitch the esophagus and stomach for a lovely woman in the US. Her dad had died of esophageal cancer, and she contacted me within twenty four hours to say, "Can you put this on a hook?" And she gave me the backstory, and of course, I did. Um, and I've done that for lots of people. So it could be that surgeons and clinicians say. This is my specialism. It could be a brain, you know, brain surgery, gastric surgery. Can you put this particular thing on a hoop? Or they will say, this is my condition. Uh, this is the part of my body I've had removed. Can you put that on a hoop? So it's wow. absolutely fascinating to hear why yeah. people want their pieces. Um, the colon I'm going to do in the next month was commissioned by somebody who had just had a colon transplant and they were commissioning me from the hospital bed so it's just it's wonderful to kind of wow. get this really kind of human background to the yeah. pieces I'm making it's really inspiring oh, fascinating I mean in some respects it's like you're saying there about the person who you know um the person had died and you think would you really want a hoop of the thing that the person had died out of I don't know but it's just like if that's what they want then that's what they want isn't it you know it, it's yeah. not the first thing that would crop up in my mind I guess but I can no, understand it's really interesting yeah I can understand if you were the like the surgeon or you know I'm an eye surgeon or a knee surgeon it's something else to go on your wall kind of thing isn't it or you know yes. whatever and I can understand this is a piece of me that's been taken away um but yeah fascinating stories behind it behind it all did did you did, did yeah. you think you would get that when you, you no. know, we'll, come, we'll come on to that in a minute of how you got into doing this but is <laughs> you know was this an unexpected side effect oh absolutely absolutely and I think what's really interested me is how much my pieces have become part of the healing process for a lot of people so for oh. example um one lovely woman last year asked me to do her a cervix on a hoop because she'd had hers removed with a cancer scare. And she was really struggling to come to terms with the fact that this part of her body had been removed. So she asked me to stitch it for her. And a lot of the stories always have that healing element that this will help them come to terms with what's happened, commemorate what's happened. Um, they want to, it, what's happened to them to kind of make sense perhaps or mean something, or they even want to celebrate it, having gotten rid of a cancer. Mm, or having mm. gotten a new colon so it's been really fascinating to start seeing the psychology of why people ask me for anatomy and especially because when I first started stitching anatomy I thought I was the only person in the world who had any interest in this at all so to see 
Firstly, doctors and clinicians wanting them is great, but then members of the public, for their own reasons, it's just been an amazing, unexpected insight. I just love all of that. Yeah, it, it is. It's absolutely fascinating, is that? It, yes. it really is, because I suppose you think, you know, when I was like laughing about um, the Institute of Medical Illustrators, or whatever, but there again, textbooks need people to draw these things because a photo's not going to be good enough no. or clear enough to pick out and 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 I was just thinking actually it's just reminded me I think it was about a year or so ago I went to an exhibition in in Beverly my local kind of market town and that was on now I remember medical illustrations oh. and it was a local lady it was a local lady who she did them in you know paint watercolor that kind of thing it was a local lady who was quite a famous medical uh, illustrator so yeah it's it's I, I don't know if I've seen any of Maddie else stitching them however I haven't looked I haven't looked but I'm not sure if I've seen any more <laughs> there are a few I've seen quite a few on Instagram who stitch but I don't really know how big the community is particularly I mean the mm-hmm. medical illustration community is pretty big yes um, all the every all the illustrations you see in hospital posters, leaflets that you're given, that's all by medical illustrators. Yeah, yeah. Students, of course, especially need good medical illustrations to find their way around the body. Um, and of course, if all the illustrations you ever saw as a patient or a doctor were photographs, you'd never find your way around the body. As a patient, you'd be horrified. I mean, yeah. as somebody who uh, I do a lot of, of course, research of the human body before I stitch, and you see, I see lots of images which I'm okay with, but I know lots of the public would not be okay with. Mm-hmm. You know, when you go for your smear, you really don't want to see photographs of diseased cervixes on a poster. So you get some nice medical illustrations instead. <laughs> so it's all about communication. It's not just illustration. It's communicating exactly what the clinicians want to their patients. Yeah. So it's quite a big art form, I guess. Yeah, and there's certainly a lot more to it, isn't there, than oh, yes. s- s- putting a few stitches in and finding a drawing kind of thing. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, well, we, 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 we could be, we'll be talking about this for hours. <laughs> 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 right. Um, okay, so that's the, the, the kind of public side of things and people um, commissioning you there. So, yeah, so we'll come back to this issue about juggling your time and um, – you know, finding time for for you. So now, something else that I just wanted to mention at this point is that I'm I'm sure I've I've read somewhere that you in a former life was a journalist. So I can understand yes. the communication aspect. You know, when you've, oh, yes. you've been talking there, talking about communicating, this is a communication in another format, isn't it? Yes, it is. I hadn't actually thought of that until you mentioned it. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, and interestingly, when I was a journalist. Um, I was I was always really fascinated with writing about the things that nobody ever really talked about. I always <laughs> had a draw towards taboo subjects. And I was never scared of writing about the things that nobody wanted to say. And I guess in a weird way, that's what I do now. That's um, what you're doing now. You've repeated yeah. you've repeated yourself, and I bet you haven't I noticed know. that. No. <laughs> well, this is like a therapy session. I honestly <laughs> hadn't realized that until now. But yeah, I'm now committed to putting what people don't want to see on hoops, I guess. So I'm yeah. forcing people to look at what they don't want to see. I'm hoping that's a good thing, generally. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think the, the 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 good thing about, as you say, the illustrations and certainly what you do is, you know, when we look at them, well, look, they're colourful, aren't they? Like yellow and pink and yes. purple and blue and all sorts of colours. And, and I've often wondered about that. But again, I just spotted some comment there about that's a thing. It's because otherwise, obviously, all the illustrations would be like red yeah. and brown and gungy, wouldn't they? Exactly. If I was to just stitch an organ as you see it, it would be a mishmash of brownie pinks and it would look like, except to the untrained eye, it would look like not much of anything. <laughs> but when you look in, um, look at medical illustrations in student textbooks, there's a lot of false colour used, and false mm, colour is a it, false big colour. tradition. Yeah, false that's colour. right. So, for example, in medical textbooks, nerves are always in yellow, and arteries are always in red, and these are kind of signposts for students, oh, so they know exactly what they're looking at. Ah, and sometimes I take that to the nth degree. I add if some people have, I don't know, a love of teal, I will try and incorporate it somehow. But I think, apart from the communication aspect. 
it really does bring a hope to life. Otherwise, it would. Uh, for example, if I were to just do the bowel or the intestines, it would just be a mishmash of pinky browns. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's about bridging. It's, I guess it's about creating a piece that's anatomically accurate and is art. Yes, and that's what yes. I'm always trying to do is juggle those two things, really. Right. That's a fascinating combination. So <laughs> how, how in a, I mean, you mentioned at the start in, in your bio there, kind of in a one liner there, that you got into doing this because you yourself had had some surgeries and it was yeah. like to combine stitching and anatomy love yeah. while you recovered. So obviously you'd obviously been stitching before then. So mm. was this literally something that kind of dawned on you while you was, yes. you know, while you was going through this? It was. Um, yeah. I, was wow. a, I was a broad sheet journalist for um, years and years and years. And I had my daughter 14 years ago and I became really ill with uh, PND and PTSD, which meant I couldn't work. And I had to give up my life as a journalist because I just couldn't cope. I, I pretty much kind of got into bed for two years and couldn't get up. And um, wow. when I started to recover, I really wanted to start hand stitching. Yeah. And I think it's because I did it as a child, perhaps. Yeah. Um, and so I made fabric items like bags and accessories and people liked them and they bought them and I sold them online a little bit. Uh, and I'd had Bell's palsy for about a decade at that point, uh, which is a uh, complete paralysis of the left side of my face. And my surgeon said, we can do a series of surgeries to try and give you movement again, which I undertook. And there was one particular surgery which went horrifyingly wrong. It was horrible. And oh, um. Dear. It was it was a weird thing. It went terribly wrong and it was awful to recover from, but it was fascinating <laughs> because it meant taking some of my chest muscles and putting them in my face and <gasps> some nerves in my leg and putting them in my face, which I loved. <laughs> and I was bored in hospital. I was recovering in hospital, bored, rigid. And I said to my husband, bring in some fabric and some thread so I can do some noodling. And it just came to me. And I'd seen so many images at that stage of the muscles of the face. And I realised they looked like straight stitches. So I thought, well, can I do this? Is it the done thing to stitch anatomy? Shouldn't I just be stitching flowers? I mean, <laughs> God, all these questions. And I thought, what the hell? So I started stitching the muscles of the face. And I went online. I found an image from Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> and um, a few months later, I had an outpatient's appointment with my surgeon. And I took it in to show him. And his reaction was just staggering. He leapt out of his chair, <gasps> yelped. He took a photo. He said, can I buy it? Can I buy it? Wow. And I was like, whoa, okay. I must be on to something. And I was so thrilled. He thought it was anatomically accurate and lovely enough to put on his living room wall. Yeah. Perhaps I'm on to something. Wow. And so it went from there, really. I did some pieces for myself, showed them to people online. They liked them. And the ball started rolling. Now I'm here talking to you. Oh, wow, that is just absolutely fascinating. It really is. It's mad. I couldn't yeah. have predicted it. <laughs> you couldn't make it up, could you, really? No. <laughs> That's no. with all the best stories. Oh, <laughs> crikey. Yes, I bet you, I, I can imagine the absolute surprise, as you say, when you showed this. Yeah. Yes. Were you expecting the, oh, yes, that's lovely, dear, kind of like, you know, but what yeah. is it? You know, you get that, but what is it? What's it for kind of question yes. that you get? And like, <laughs> looking back, I don't know what possessed me to show him. I can't think what possessed me to show him. I'm not even sure why I'd have the guts to do that now, but I show him I did something clearly drove me to do it. I like the guy. We got on really well, so I figured I, I, would, I would just go for it. But his reaction just blew me away, completely blew me away. And that was kind of, um, I guess, the pat on the back that made me keep going. It's interesting. If his reaction had been, oh, that's lovely, dear. Now show me your stitches. I might have put it down and never, ever gone back to it. And now I'd be doing something else. But he was like the the, the starting gun at a race. And yeah. off I went. Yeah, he was the you know, the catalyst, really. I suppose the enthusiastic spark that yes. uh, that that was much needed at the time, obviously from yes. what you were saying. And wow. I think interestingly, I've always loved anatomy, um, but nobody else around me has. <laughs> and I've always felt a little bit freakish for loving that sort of thing. Yeah. So when I met a kindred spirit who also loved that, it, it reminded it made me think, you know what? Perhaps I'm not the only person who likes anatomical arts. And interestingly, if you went on Instagram now and looked at the hashtag anatomy art or anatomical art, 
there are millions, millions of people out there who love exactly the same thing and creating their own pieces of anatomical art. So I guess it's about finding your tribe. But once you've found mm. it, you've kind of found your place. It is, and that's that's so true. And I suppose as much as we kind of, you know, love and hate Instagram, et cetera, with, oh, equ- yes, with, equ- yes. with equal amounts, God, it yes. has been a way for us to find our our little tribe wherever. And, and although... You know, we we talk about you know, certainly in marketing and business. You know, what's your niche kind of thing, yes. and and you can think, oh God, this is just like the most niche of nichey nicheness. Oh. You know, I mean, let's face it, embroidery and an anatomical art you just wouldn't have put together at all. But no. here you are, and you found other people who follow you because of that and you know i mean you've got a lot Mad. of followers as well on instagram so yes. you know it's just you've you've you do you attract you attract the people who are interested in what it is that you're doing and it's a big yes. world out there isn't it so even though you think it's the nichest of niche niches it, you know there's still thousands and thousands and thousands of people which is enough to make yes a business out of we don't need Nine million people no. or nine hundred million. You know, we need exactly. that. You know, it's the people who really want our stuff is what, yeah, what we need. You just so. need enough people to buy your stuff. That's yeah. it. Yeah, and none of us. We all think we're truly unique, but the truth, the brutal truth, is that we're not. <laughs> we can't be, can and we? <laughs> if you love something, there'll be somebody else out there who loves it, and not just one other person. Lots of other person. You, you can think of the most dark, freakish, weird dark web thing and there'll be plenty of other people out there who love it too so it's about finding those people now that's not easy no but when no you, they are out there you've just got to somehow find them and thank god instagram can help you do that it may break you in the meantime but it will help you do that <laughs> <laughs> Right, so I think that's answered the question there about getting started. That's really fascinating. Uh-huh. And so, in terms of, you know, you said you liked you, you, you were already doing hand stitching. Were you doing much, or was it was this a thought? Right, I'm just so bored. I'm going to start doing it again, and I haven't done it for that long. Yeah, I did. Um, I done some hand stitching when I was recovering from my breakdown after with my PNT and PTSD. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I got to a point where I was wasn't well enough to work, not by a long chalk, but I needed something to occupy my time as I recovered. Yeah. And yeah. so I kind of got myself a cheap sewing machine. I did some sewing. I did some hand sewing. I started sewing a, a hand sewing a quilt. Um, I mean, that's nearly 10 years old and I still haven't finished it. Um, <laughs> and so already that was kind of there. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah. It's really interesting that um, I used to sew as a child and a young teenager. And I fell out of all of that when I went to university and I went partying and I got a career. And my breakdown kind of raised everything to the ground. And I started doing the things that came back into my head that I remembered I enjoyed. Yeah. And hand sewing yeah. was one of them. Yeah. Lovely. So I'd been doing that for a few years, like past four years. So by the time I had the surgery, my hands were already used to stitching. Yeah. And I'd always loved embroidery, but... I'd never found a theme I enjoyed embroidering. <laughs> I looked online and there were lots of beautiful flowers and landscapes and so skills, but that just wasn't me. Yeah, and I just yeah. needed something else. And um, when I realised the muscles of the face looked like straight stitches, it was just like a light bulb moment in my head. <laughs> and like I say, I even considered, should I be doing this? Is this some terrible dark art? You know, Oh, I am, am I allowed? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> It was so new to me. It was like, whoa, boggling. But thankfully, I kind of uh, listened to my inner voice and went for it. And that's so, that's the thing, isn't it? You know, let, let's not let other people's perceived opinions or thoughts, because it's all crap anyway, isn't it? We, we Just what we think somebody else thinks isn't what they're actually thinking. So I don't know why we even waste our time with all that rubbish. So, you exactly. know, l- l- luckily you just powered on and thought, you know what, stuff it, I'm going to do this. And yeah. here we are. One of the things I've done, I've kind of put like I've put mental blinkers on to the point I rarely even look at other embroiderers now on Instagram mm. because I know I'll start comparing myself and questioning myself. So I don't even look at them now. Yeah. I just put my head down and I figure this is my path. This is what I love. Forget what anyone else thinks. Yeah. And it's good to the point now where when I it's interesting, a couple of times I've shown my work to people 
in real life physically shown them a piece yeah, yeah. and they have physically backed away from me like I'm a serial killer <laughs> and I'm at a point now where I find that funny rather than upsetting so hopefully I'm shaking off that comparisonitis slowly I'm getting yeah, there yeah <laughs> yeah do, do you um I, I don't suppose you kind of sit on buses stitching or anything like that you well, know I have done yes what, you, what you're doing <laughs> oh I have done and people's reactions are yeah, amazing yes. yeah sometimes they'll back away yeah there was one really such a memorable moment I was in a Sainsbury's cafe <laughs> one evening and the local kind of stitch and bitch was there and I'd seen them a few times I think the youngest woman there was perhaps like 75 and they'd always <laughs> watch what I was doing but never come over Mm. And one day, one of them came over and said, oh, I've got to ask you, I keep seeing you. And I was stitching the uterus and the ovaries and the <laughs> cervix. And it was the most fascinating conversation. She didn't know what it was. And I thought it was very clear what it was because it was almost complete. Yeah. And she had a few children. I think she was in her 80s, but she had no idea that's what her own uterus and it ovaries and like. talking tubes looked like. Wow. So I explained it to her and her face lit up. She was like, oh that's that's it that's what my babies were in oh was wow like, she was in a and I was like whoa there was what? this <laughs> moment of art and communication and friendship and that just lit my mind up wow. so it's amazing the conversations that start when yeah the stitching. so I, I remember stitching again stitching a vagina while I was flying to Boston oh that's practically porn honestly <laughs> <laughs> past how's your vagina going yeah. do you want a drink when you're doing your vagina and they just loved it so it's people's reactions to it are absolutely fascinating oh dear oh, it's, just... it's quite mad when you think about it <laughs> <laughs> oh i mean one of them moves i can't stop laughing oh that's just <laughs> hilarious series that that's really good um right so so you 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 uh went down on this path when you realized that muscles in the face could be done with straight stitches so in terms of yeah. technique and stitches then what's what's your stitch repertoire on anatomical ah, embroidery then it's terrifyingly small <laughs> people look at my pieces and think they're really complex and i say no they're essentially street stitches split stitches a little bit of couching if i'm in the mood and french knots and that's it that's it and it's not about the complexity of the, the stitches or the repertoire it's about the way in which you use them. Mm, and yes. Because anatomy, you know, you look at all these fancy embroidery stitches. I've got the, I think the embroidery stitches Bible here, whatever it's called. <laughs> yes, there's loads of magical there. stitches yeah. in. There's loads and they're great. But there's no way I'm going to use those to replicate, say, the surface of the heart. And that <laughs> look actually texturally accurate. So there are very few stitches I can actually use, really. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, it's all about understanding the textures of different parts of the anatomy. I do um, dissection where I can in order to understand those <laughs> textures. Um, and it is just down to street stitches, split stitches and French knots. It's that simple, bizarrely. Uh, do it's you know, more well, complex than it is. When you mentioned dissection about... A millisecond before that, I was just thinking, oh, I'm going to ask her about, do you dissect things? <laughs> yes, I do. So I you do. do then, yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, I've got several books of photographic dissectors. They are books that students use, and they're just packed with photographs of dissected humans. So you can see what all the parts look like. Yeah. Um, so in the past, I've been able to get organs from specialist student services. They provide students with organs, usually from pigs, because that's the closest to humans. Yeah, and you can yeah. dissect them in your own home. I think we did a pig hat at school, if I remember rightly. I think we did a frog and something to do with a pig. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're fascinating. Very close to humans. Um, I've got a cat who brings in lots of dead vermin, and I'll dissect that. <laughs> um, I was lucky enough to have a well, not lucky for the squirrel, lucky. <laughs> but a squirrel was hit by a car outside my house about a year ago, and I had him up off the road and I had him open, <laughs> and um, he was full of nuts. Literally, his stomach had exploded, and there were just nuts everywhere, and it oh, was fascinating. Oh, bless it. And my poor family, uh, you know, I walk in with like this dead animal in my hand. I'm just off to the shed, get my dissection kit out. Um, it's fascinating. I found a dead sheep on one of my woodland walks. He was properly dead. So I managed to bring home some bits so I could 
I cleaned it up to catch his skull. <laughs> yes, I remember the sheep skull. I couldn't remember why I remember the sheep skull. From sheep somewhere. skull. That's it, it yeah. Was, it's very kind of um, broken hair, I yeah. guess. <laughs> he was very dead. He'd been dead a long time. His eyes and tongue had gone. But I managed to, you know, cut his head off, put it in a plastic bag, carry it home. If anyone had stopped me, they'd have arrested me. I must have looked like a maniac. <laughs> <laughs> but I cleaned him up, I looked at his skull, I've got a skull here in the shed and his teeth. And without that, I think I'd find it much harder to stitch what I do. Yeah. You can look at textbooks all day. Yeah. But you need to hold something in your hand and feel it with your mm. fingertips, the textures. So, for example, French knots are great for fat because fat is really bobbly. And it can be really good for glands because glands are quite bu- um, bumpy and bubbly. Oh. Oh, yeah, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't you never need thought. to understand the textures to replicate them in stitches. So I like to say it's not just uh, me being wildly weird and gory. It's an actual element of research and development, if you see what I mean. <laughs> and medical illustrators do this. Um, if you do any uh, accredited medical illustration course, you have to do anatomy, and that involves human dissection, because otherwise you can't illustrate yeah. what the body looks like. So to anyone who's currently... Hitting the panic button or phoning the police. This is all perfectly normal. <laughs> <laughs> and you all thought you were listening to two ladies wittering on about embroidery. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I wish I hadn't put you on hold for a year. It serves me right, doesn't it? <laughs> Thank you. I could have had all this enjoyment a year ago. <laughs> Interesting. You're talking about dissection and that squirrel. Uh, I think one of my most popular Instagram stories was where I dissected the squirrel's penis and put it on my stories and everyone went berserk. (laughs) They loved it. That's got to be one of my most popular Instagram stories of all time. So I'm not alone in my weirdness. (laughs) You've really set me off now. Oh, who'd honestly? Uh, uh, well, that just sums up social media. Who'd honestly thought that a story about we're dissecting a squirrel's penis would be uh, like a wildly popular? For everyone. There, abs- <laughs> there absolutely is. <laughs> oh, brilliant! Uh, right, so do you know, I've, I've got tears in my eyes from from like you know, like crying with laughter. It's just like honestly. <laughs> Oh dear! Right, so, so, so move, moving swiftly on. Oh yes. Um, so, so how long have you been doing this now, then, Kath? You probably told me, but I forgot oh. from laughing. I think I, I think I did my first anatomical embroidery perhaps six years ago. Right, right. Um, and when I was doing it, then that was the first one I did. I think approximately six years ago, and then I just did them for myself for perhaps like a year or two. Right. Yeah. And then a few people asked me for some, and I did some. Um, And I was doing anatomical embroidery then uh, alongside the fabric things I was stitching for people. Yeah. Um, And that, I I was kind of falling out of love with that fabric, you know, making the bags. Making the the stuff, yeah. Yeah. And lockdown, put the lid on that because suddenly everyone wanted me to make them masks, face masks. (laughs) And I did. And I had so many commissions. I think I must have cried for months every day, stitching hundreds of masks. And any love I had left for stitching (laughs) fabric was completely <laughs> booted out of me and so I had one of my almost annual night of the dark soul long night of the soul but I thought I just want to do anatomical embroidery can I should I uh, and I thought yeah what the hell I'll just go for it so now I just pretty much do anatomical embroidery um and even though I do phrased hoops I do phrases on hoops for people who want them yeah I haven't been commissioned one of those in oh ages and ages and ages it's just yeah. anatomical embroidery all the way now yeah, cool. Well, that's that's it. Well, I suppose it's unique as well, isn't it? Or you yes. know, relatively unique. Whereas, yeah. you know, I suppose you can quite relatively easily get hoops with things written on them. So, yeah, not yeah. many hoops with spleens or vaginas <laughs> on them. No, Sadly. no. <laughs> <laughs> you are the queen of those. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, right. So. Two high points I, I just want to talk to you about. Um, first one, your five bronze awards. Yes. Wow. Holy moly. That's, That's amazing. amazing. Um, last year, I was contacted by the editor of the Journal of Communication in Medicine. <laughs> Another thing, who knew? <laughs> I had no idea. 
And she'd seen my work on Instagram and asked me to uh, submit some of my work to the journal, which they showed, which was so exciting. Um, and I became an affiliate member of the Institute of Medical Illustration. And they've got annual awards and I'd seen the past awards. And I've always, there's always an element of imposter syndrome yeah. in what I do. Yeah. Sometimes more than an element, massive amounts. And I kept thinking, shall I, shan't I? And then one day I thought, sod it, I'm just going to do it. Sod it, I'm going to do it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought, don't think about it. And I did. And I submitted six pieces. And in the summer, I was told I'd won for five of them. Wow. And that was just amazing because, um, and I've mentioned this in my Hot Off the Hook newsletter, sometimes what I do comes with a big dose of loneliness. I never feel like I fit into the embroidery world or the medical illustration world. Mm -hmm. So to get the awards was just boggling. It made me feel like I do have a place and the award has come from people who really know their way around the human body. Yeah. So mm. while I really research and study the anatomy I'm stitching, to have professionals say, yeah, that's a perfect representation of the anterior surface of the heart, it's like, whoa! Wow, boggling. yeah, very, very validating. Yes, wow. that's exactly it. Wow. So, you know, I can't imagine what I'd have been like if I'd have got a silver or a gold, but for me, bronze was like... I don't know, winning at the Olympics. Five of them. Wow. It's boggling. And and we were yours the only stitched ones? Did yours stand out from being stitched? Well, I think um Oh don't you know? You, no, no, don't know. I don't really know. Yeah, I know yeah. with the Medical Illustration Awards, I think eighty percent of that organization uh illustration is all about photography. So I'm wondering if mine stood out just because they were embroidered. Um, but I'm assuming if they weren't anatomically correct or weren't well done, or there wasn't good artistry in them, I well, just no, that you yeah, no, exactly. So me. there we are. They are anatomically correct. They yeah. are artistry. They were eye catching, which they are. You know, ex- That's so what I'm you know you've, you've ticked tick, ticked lots of boxes there. Obviously, to have got those it's, awards. That's yeah, amazing. absolutely. It's really oh, well done. Yeah, like I said, it's, it often feels like a lonely path, and that's really helped me feel like. Yet again, I'm finding my tribe. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah it's very oh. validating. Wow, fabulous. And then the other high point, which was a high point and probably a what the hell have I done point, was you <sighs> mentioned that um, a story or a post had gone viral on Instagram oh, and that then kicked off a yeah. big demand for commissions, which was great, but then there's yeah. the flip side. So do you want to just talk us through a bit about that? Because everyone goes, Holy oh, wow, really? you know, ace to be viral. But then what the hell happens next? Go on, Kat. Yeah. <laughs> my my lovely husband has got this kind of philosophy about sometimes you don't know you've climbed the wrong mountain until you're on the top of the mountain and you look <laughs> back and think, shit, it's the wrong one. Climbed the wrong bloody mountain. <laughs> yeah, you climbed the wrong bloody mountain. And I think that's what, ha- in some ways, that's what happened with this. So I'd always wanted to go viral. You do, you know, mm-hmm. you, you get the promise of people seeing your product and you get the recognition and the validation. Yeah. Whoa. And that was fantastic. I did a viral, no, sorry, I did a reel. It coincided with a small write-up about me in a magazine. And I think that's what got the ball rolling. Um, I got nearly 2 million views on the oh. reel, which was boggling. Wow. One of those moments where you sit with your phone in your hand and the numbers just keep You can just see them, ding, 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 ding. Yeah, mine have only gone up to about 1800s, but that's still exciting. <laughs> Two million, wow. Cool. I know. <laughs> and I went from 5,000 followers to 32,000 in about a week. It was just insane. Wow. I know. It was just like, oh. of course, if you've got imposter syndrome like I have, I mean, it really goes into overdrive. Oh my God, they've got the wrong account. After, what the hell are they following me for? <laughs> yes. Any minute now, they're going to see I'm a complete imposter and they're going to unfollow me. Oh. And of course, the commissions start coming in, which was fantastic. It was fantastic. And I think the, do- the only downside was the amount of, um, God, this is going to sound very ungracious of me, the amount of administration, emails, mm-hmm. DMs, yeah, yeah, yeah. requests I had to deal with. So, uh, I went from spending almost my entire working day stitching to spending almost four hours every day just responding to emails and DMs and requests. And I found that really difficult. And I've got ADHD. I was um, diagnosed with that a year ago. And one of my problems is prioritizing. I'm really, right, yeah. it's a common trait of ADHD where 
I find it hard to prioritise. Um, I want to do everything, or my brain tells me I need to do everything now. now I can't yeah. put it in a list of things to do. And um, so when I was getting all, all these requests and messages, it was great, but it was also exhausting. And everyone took a little bit out of me. Yeah. And of yeah. course, when you commission, I don't know what, this is like another types of embroidery. But when somebody asks me if they can commission a piece, there's a process I have to go through before I can give them a price. I yes, can't just say yes. a nine inch hoop is this, a six inch hoop yeah, is that. Yeah. I need to know the complexity of what they want. So every request took this chunk of time where I had to work out what they wanted and then price it up. And this is massive knock on effect then in terms of my time. And because of my ADHD, the mental space, my bandwidth was getting shorter and smaller. Mm-hmm. And it was really interesting that the the, the reel went viral in the at the start of February. And I don't think it was until June that I started feeling normal again. Wow. I, was, I, I got to a point where I had massive, months, massive wow. amounts of anxiety, oh. overwhelm. I think I cried twice a week <laughs> that entire time. <sighs> so it's weird. While it was great, nobody tells you about the downside. They say uh, you'll get all these followers yeah, and all yeah, this love, yeah. but they don't say that every time you open Instagram, there's 300 new messages since yesterday, and you have to respond to them. So it was a really interesting judging act. So yes, I'm very grateful, but yes, I'm, I was very exhausted, and I think I might have climbed the wrong mountain. Mountain. <laughs> yeah. That is a great analogy, and well, thank you for so bravely sharing that story because you know it is the 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 flip side of. Yes fame shall we say um you know and when it's you as as a as a as a one woman band yes. sitting in a shed doing her thing yeah. then to have all of this extra to deal with as lovely as it is it, it can be extremely can be extremely difficult as well yes. so you know th- thank you for sharing that that, that story and there's a there's a a, a lady uh She's called Eleanor. I've just forgotten her second last name. She's the lady who did the lovely drawing of Paddington and the Queen, Tomlinson. Oh. Yeah, with that, she did those lovely drawings. And she got exactly the same, you know, when she oh, kind yeah. of sent that out. It kind of went absolutely bonkers, as you can imagine. Yeah. Of course, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the recent events with the Queen, she's now you know kind of getting all that again but then yeah. suffering from a massive amount of piracy of her work oh. and, you know so so she's also you know really massively experienced that flip side yes. um of the, of the not of the not so great aspect of the speed i think it's the speed isn't it it's the yes. speed at which social media can react to oh, something yes. and the the, the right. kind of lightning fast way in which things can just you know yes go and i think as, as I said at the time it was happening, if I'd have had all that attention spread out over a year, I'd yeah. be fine. Awesome. But yeah. to have it in a couple of weeks yeah. was just like, whoa. And yeah. I, remember, I found myself scared to switch my phone on because it would mean there was all these messages and emails. And it's such a faff, isn't it? You know, your, your, your phone or even trying to, trying to do it on, you know, with your computer is a lot easier. But, you know, pecking yeah. away on your phone, it's just like enough to make anybody oh, go exhausting. blind and insane, isn't it, really? so. And I, Weirdly, I think I I did talk a lot at the time about how it shows perhaps the generational differences. Mm. I do everything on my laptop. There are lots of people out there who do it all on Instagram. (laughs) So I'm having to explain the complexities of commissioning in a one-inch square screen with one finger a thousand times a day. And I'm like, I can't do this. Can't do it, yeah. (laughs) So um, And I think I got quite frustrated as well. uh, And this is going to sound awful. You feel free to cut this. Yeah. (laughs) The amount of information that's on my website about my prices, my commissioning process, but nobody ever looked at that. They would just message me and say, how do you commission? So then I have to do that every day. And I, I just want to start shouting at people, just thank Please you read for your that message website. me. Yeah, yeah. But that was just sort of exhaustion and frustration. But it's all turned out really well. It's all gone really well now. I'm, I'm back to normal. <laughs> <laughs> and so no, that, well, kind of, that, that kind of leads into... Um, you know, we've talked about managing creative time and, yeah. you know, so obviously you've, it didn't go quite as planned. Obviously no. you didn't plan to have something go viral and you had no, no. idea what would happen after. No. 
but I think what you've learned from that is is kind of leading on to, you know, I quite often discuss about managing creative time, but yes. I, I do remember seeing on um, on Instagram as well, you're making a post not so long back saying, right, hang on, if you want to commission me in 2023, crack yes. on because I'm making some big changes to how I manage my yes. artists. And you mentioned that at the start. So do you want to just kind of go into that a bit for us, Kath, as well? Because yeah. I know everybody just like, I just want to sit and stitch. And then, you know, you're answering emails for four hours a day, et cetera. So you've obviously <laughs> taken what you learned from that experience and obviously lots of things over the last six years. Where are you going now with it then, Kath? What's, you know, how yeah. how, how do you want to balance your time now? Um, I think the tentative plan at the moment is next year, in every quarter, I spend six weeks on commissions, six weeks on my own art, which will be anatomical art, Perfect. but the things I want to stitch. Yeah. And um, I think the joy of having all these commissions is, of course, I get to stitch lots of parts of the body I wouldn't necessarily choose myself. So that's great. Yeah. However, mm. every commission, and there are so many, requires a deadline. So I've got this schedule where I know exactly what I'm stitching in six weeks' time, and and that kind of can suck the artistry out of it. And sometimes I feel like I'm kind of, it's like almost stitching by numbers. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, I've got to get this colon done by this date so I can do <laughs> this heart by this date. <laughs> and it was interesting, over the summer, I gave myself four weeks over the summer, six weeks, four weeks, to stitch one particular piece of the heart, which I want to turn into a print. And the joy of just sitting down and stitching without the top clock ticking. It, ah, so that was purely for you. Stitching. That was yes. purely for you, that, that hard. Yeah. Right, and right. while I've got the plan to turn it into a print, it's at the printer at the moment, actually. Yeah. Um, I knew that if I didn't finish it, the world wasn't going to end. It wasn't going to knock my schedule out by six months. It wasn't going to be a nightmare. And it really reminded me of the joy of stitching without a deadline. So next year is going to be about balancing the commercial pressures with the artistic urges. <laughs> God knows if I'm going to balance them. I dare say there'll be more long nights of the soul and tears because there always are. More tension, more joy. Yes, but that's the plan. So I can do the commissions, which I love. You know, you must never yeah. think I don't love doing them, yeah. but I also need my own artistic freedom as well. Um, and that is the plan. The idea being when I create my own artistic pieces, they can become prints as well. Yeah. If people love those, they can buy them. If they love the original, they can buy that. Um, interestingly as well, I think something I've learned is, and uh, I, I think I, I'm finally getting my head around pricing. I should have done it long before. Yay, it's the hardest thing ever. <laughs> oh, my God. The imposter syndrome in me is like, why don't you just give it away for free? So attach a fiver to it, pay somebody to take it off your Take hands. it away, yeah. So um, I think the amount of... Um, support and love I've had for my work this year has made me realise I just need to put my prices up. Mm-hmm. And I went through a phase again of, if I price it like this, will somebody buy it? And I thought in the end, you know what, screw it. I'm going to price it what I want to sell it for. And if nobody wants to pay for that, then fine, they can buy a print instead. If somebody can afford it, then they're welcome to have it. But I am just sick of always doing this push and pull trying to price myself up, price myself down, getting always feeling like I'm getting it wrong. I thought instead I'm going to inhabit my own kind of pricing space, price them the way I think they should be priced and be damned. So that's what I'm doing. You may interview me this time next year where I'm eating out of bins and starving because I've earned no money. <laughs> but I'd be artistically happy, so that's something, right? I mean, got to cling to that. <laughs> So as I said, it's all the juggling and shifting, and hopefully I'm getting there. It really is. And the thing is, listening to you there describe the woes and difficulties of pricing <laughs> it is exactly the same for, you know, I've run an online business for 12 yeah. years now, and I did a lot of services, which is, you know, some, somebody is commissioning me to do something for them, give yeah. them my advice, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same kind of thing. Often you've got no idea how long this thing will take. You're spending ages communicating with people, what it is that you want, getting down to what is really needed because what Mm. they think they need and want is totally different often from (laughs) all these hidden steps of things that need to be done that you can't actually see anything. until you know, all It's all so similar. And, you know, ultimately you have to think about 
who is it who's your ideal person? Yes. And if your ideal person is somebody who loves anatomy, is a surgeon, etc., well, let's face it, they're not eating out of bins, are they? They no. have money. They can afford me. They can afford you. Yes. And they appreciate just like that instant reaction from your surgeon. Yes. You know, he leapt out of his chair in glee. Yes. <laughs> that's the person, that's your ideal person, isn't it? Yes. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. And, I, and I think there's so many of us do ourselves a massive disservice by listening to those stupid voices in our head which say nobody can afford that oh i know, you know and it's so it is so bloody difficult it oh. really really is yes. but you know it's the it's 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 the same but different and that's you know the parallels i join between you know i, I make no bones about it Textile art is my hobby, absolutely and utterly my hobby. And I'm, I'm so slow at it because I don't really give it much time. <laughs> but what's, you know, I'm, I'm here I am 12 years later still in business. My business has evolved. Same thing. I used to have a schedule. I used to create courses for other people as well, you know. So oh. they were like months of of extreme, just do this, don't do anything else. So the parallels are all exactly the same. Yeah. And, you know, so in terms of helping people with advice or pricing or anything it is the same issues we all juggle with the same issues you're juggling with how to 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 sell and create something made out of fabric and thread and and i am yeah. trying to co- encapsulate all of those years of of it knowledge etc to help people create a course but it's the it's very the processes are very very similar so yes, and it's, it's really great to listen to you kind of detail the steps because i'm sure so many other people are sitting here going oh yes god yes that's me think about who the perfect person is yes do they have the money if they don't well maybe you need to change your perfect person because we're in business you know well it's interesting you say that because the fallout of my viral reel meant i was getting hundreds of dms and emails every day from people and the range of people who wanted my work was so great it was everything between people who would say i've got two thousand pounds to spare what can you make to people who would say can i have the entire anatomy of the human body for 30 (laughs) pounds and so suddenly i realized i'm trying to i'm trying to make room for all of these people and it's like no actually i can't i can't do the entire human body for 30 pounds by the weekend i mean no yeah go away so and it's interesting why a lot of people don't understand embroidery they don't understand the complexity of it so i get that they may not get the pricing and i'm always trying to in, educate yeah, people on yeah, it in, yes you Equally, do there's a point at which where that's not my problem i've got to earn a living and that again is so powerful that is not my problem yeah. you can't solve the world's problems no. i can't teach everybody in the whole wide world everything there is to know about whatever you know no. you can't stitch a whole body in no. you know in in a weekend no. for 30 quid that's your life's work no boundaries it's back yes. to our, our boundaries as business people yes. and artists what are our boundaries and it's hard because very hard when you have to put a boundary in place you have to face so much about yourself. Mm-hmm. What am I worth? Am yeah. I worth these boundaries? Is this just the imposter in me taking the piss? And you have to question, you have to look yourself in the mirror and kind of look at what you're about. And it's really hard. Mm-hmm. And they're mm-hmm. with me because my you know my mental health it can be quite up and down with my past and my ADHD. There are always tears and this deep delving into what I think I'm worth. Mm, but if yeah. you don't have those boundaries, you start going insane. Yeah, and that's mm-hmm. one of the things that always forces me to put a boundary in place. It's like, okay, do Absolutely. what's harder, having the boundary or getting into bed for two years again? Which one of those is going to be the thing I'm most willing to do? And it's not going to be getting back into bed for bed. two years. No, it's going no. to be just saying no. I can't teach you how to do anatomical embroidery in the Instagram DM box because you just asked me on a whim. I mean, whoa! So yeah. no. It's a complete sentence, as they say, isn't it? You've just got to say no, politely and nicely, but thoroughly. <laughs> yeah, e- exactly. It, it is, because otherwise you will go absolutely insane. And also... You will lose your you, mind. You, you will. You just feel as if you're being pulled away. You know, I, I mean, I get the same thing. People will kind of set, send me a DM about stuff. And it, it's basically 
questions about things that I would do a whole course on or I have a course on, you know. And so you kind of like, you don't want to be, because we're nice and kind and we don't want to be rude and, you know, well, you know, you can do this, but I have a course, you know. So sometimes you feel, well, it feels rude to say, well, you can learn all of that in my course. Here's the link. Yes. Or, um, if you know, feel free to, um, you know, I can give you a quick answer to that. But um, I, I deal with that. You can book me for my normal hourly rate. Here's the link, you know, that kind of thing. But, oh, God, it takes you years to get around to doing, feeling as if you're, like, brave enough to do that, which is so silly, isn't it? But, yeah, you've really, it really is. explained that so well, Kath. Thank and you I, so I think much. with social media, as people who have to harness social media to sell, we're always told be open, approachable, friendly, helpful, give them 80% of the information, but not that little bit more because they got to pay for that. Give value. And you almost kind of, <laughs> that's it, it's the wrong word, but pushed into just giving it all away. And then when you do it, get to a point where you have to say no, you feel like a cow for saying no, but you're not. You're just no. doing what you should have done yeah, in the yeah, first yeah, place. Exactly. Yeah, you have to do it. So, yeah, that's, that's really has been a, a very, very brave uh, conversation. <laughs> Uh, it's a conversation that a lot of people don't want to have and don't want to talk about either. So, um, you know, as I say, I'm I'm with you all the way, Cass. I've Thank been you. through the same evolution just <laughs> with, you know, just because something's easy for me doesn't mean to say it's yes. not easy for everybody else. And just because it's something in my head that has taken me 12 years of constant learning to get to the point yes. where I am, like you've spent all yes. those years researching and cutting things up, et cetera. Yes. You know, we deserve to be paid <sighs> for our yes. knowledge and our skill and everybody everybody does regardless of what it is that they're doing so yeah that's that's that sparked off a really interesting conversation respecting. yeah yeah and and <laughs> we you. are we are fantastic and that's what we have to say to ourselves all the time we have to so remember that we are fantastic <laughs> <laughs> right i think then kath um so future plans so you've explained what your idea is about how you're going to manage your time and put your boundaries in place. Yeah. So, what sort of art have you got? What What are you going to tease us with? Some things that you you're desperate to stitch. Oh my What's God. on your list? Oh lordy, I've just finished, um, and it's gone to the printer. Uh, a piece of the heart, the anterior surface of the heart, which I'm really pleased with. And I think I want to do some follow up pieces of uh, cutaways of the heart from the anterior side where um, I create like a little window in the heart and you can see into it and see what structures are beyond the surface. So that's the next big thing I want to do. I think essentially it's about me exploring parts of the anatomy that I'd really like to do myself. Mm. Um, so not just being tied to commissions, uh, finding my own way, parts of the, God, I'm not explaining that very well. Essentially stitching the parts of the human body that really inspire me I'm excited to do. Yeah. I don't always know what they are in advance. Uh-huh. I will start with my Grey's Anatomy or my my book full of dissection images and flip through <laughs> it until something kind of sets my mind on fire. I've got this lovely dream of doing a hoop and each flap has uh, a different layer of the anatomy on it. I have no clue whether that's technically possible. Uh, like a, like a kid's book it, almost. Life's work. Yes, yes, exactly. So, um, I've got no idea if that's ever going to be a thing. And if it is, it'll take years of work. But I just want the chance to explore and see what's possible for me to do. And they will all be pieces that I can sell as prints because Mm. I do have to make this commercially viable. But um, right now, I think I'm just excited to kind of feel my way and see what there is to do, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think next year, again, we go back to the themes of artistic loneliness. But I am uh, very, uh, how do I explain? I'm not surrounded by people who are artistic. So I've got no idea, for example, how to set up an exhibition, um, how to license my images, uh, how to network with other artists. So something I want to to do next year is do all of that, try all of that, find out how to get a grant from an artistic organisation and do something with that. So it's all that kind of broader stuff as well as the sitting down and stitching what yeah. I want to do as well. Yeah. Embracing that tool, being an artist rather than um, somebody kind of churning out images. It took it was a big step yeah. um, perhaps six months ago. 
to say, I'm going to be an artist from now I'm on. an artist, yeah. And yeah. it was really hard. Mm. And you can see in the word artist, I describe it as like having marbles in my mouth. It was just like, I can't get the words out. It feels silly and indulgent. But I want to, it feels less silly and indulgent now. And I want to inhabit that space more. So I'm going to explore how to do that, I think, next yeah. year. That's the plan. Brilliant. And brilliant. eating of the bins, of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what artists do, of course. <laughs> in a lonely, cold garret in South Wales, that's what I will be doing. <laughs> <laughs> Woman sits in shed and sews random things. <laughs> yeah, sleeping ends of the table, stitching on top of the table. That's what I will be doing <laughs> in my sleeping bag. <laughs> Well, I think we wish you all the best, um, Kath, you. with your artistic journey. And it's about developing the the art practice, isn't it? The business side, the, the all the other things that then come out of the ability to create images using fabric and thread that people want to buy. Yes, exactly. I think it's just pursuing that and hoping that my enthusiasm for it kind of comes across and other people see that. They realise I'm not just a weirdo who wants to inhabit graveyards and get hands on <laughs> bodies, that there's beauty. And I think that's one of the things I love about finding my tribe. They see beyond the gore and they see the beauty of the human body. Yes. And that's what I want to kind of commit to fabric is that there is beauty when you stop panicking at the blood. Yeah. There is just wonder in the human body. And I think it deserves to go on a hoop. Yeah, yes, I, think so. <laughs> I think it really does deserve to go on a hoop, absolutely. <laughs> Kath, just absolutely fascinating. I've thoroughly, thoroughly Thank enjoyed you. having a chat with you. And um, everybody, so if you aren't already following Kath, then go and follow Kath. Um, her <laughs> links are all in the uh, episode on Stitch with Stories, and I'll be sharing pictures on Instagram as well, of course. And, um, yeah, go and sign up for a Hot Off the Hoop as well, because it's great. It really is Yes, good. it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kath. This has been absolutely brilliant. So, so I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much. Yes, you too. It was worth the wait after all. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> brilliant. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, then please join the Stitchery Stories fan club so you can get an email when a new episode is released. It's a quick and easy way of listening and of keeping up with any news and information around this podcast please visit stitcherystories.com. Of course, you can listen to Stitchery Stories on plenty of podcast apps at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify and plenty more besides. You can also ask your smart speaker to play Stitchery Stories podcast too. But wherever you listen, why not leave us a rating and a review to encourage other people to listen too? I very much appreciate you taking the time to do that for me. So that is the end of our Stitchery story for today. Keep stitching, keep smiling and keep creating your very own Stitchery stories.